Chapter 4, Part 10 This sharing in no way diminishes the spirit of struggle, courage, capacity for love, or daring required for the revolutionary leaders. Fidel Castro and his comrades, who many at the time termed irresponsible adventurers, is eminently a dialogical leadership group, identified with the people who endured the brutal violence of the Batista dictatorship. This adherence was not easy. It required bravery on the part of the leaders to love the people sufficiently to be willing to sacrifice themselves for them. It required courageous witness by the leaders to recommence after each disaster, moved by undying hope in a future victory which, because forged together with, with the people, would belong not to the leaders alone, but to the leaders and the people, or to the people including the leaders. Fidel gradually polarized the adherents of the Cuban people, who due to their historical experience, had already begun to break their adhesion to the oppressor. This drawing away from the oppressor led the people to objectify him, and to see themselves as his contradiction. So it was that Fidel never entered into contradiction with the people. The occasional desert desertations, desertions, desertions or betrayals registered by Guevara in his Relato de Guerra Revolucionaria, in which he also refers to the many who adhered, were to be expected. Thus, due to certain historical conditions, the movement by the revolutionary leaders to the people is either horizontal, so that leaders and people form one body in contradiction to the oppressor, or it is triangular, with the revolutionary leaders occupying the vertex of the triangle in contradiction to the oppressors and to the oppressed as well. As we have seen, the latter situation is forced on the leaders when the people have not yet achieved a critical perception of oppressive reality. Almost never, however, does a revolutionary leadership group perceive that it constitutes a contradiction to the people. Indeed, this perception is painful, and the resistance may serve as a defense mechanism. After all, it is not easy for leaders who have emerged through adherence to the oppressed to recognize themselves as being in contradiction with those to whom they adhered. It is important to recognize this reluctance when analyzing certain forms of behavior on the part of revolutionary leaders who involuntarily become a contradiction, although not antagonists of the people. In order to carry out the revolution, revolutionary leaders undoubtedly require the adherence of the people. When leaders who constitute a contradiction to the people seek this adherence, and find rather a certain aloofness and mistrust, they often regard this reaction as indicating an inherent defect on the part of the people. They interpret a certain historical moment of the people's consciousness as evidence of their intrinsic deficiency. Since the leaders need the adherence of the people so that the revolution can be achieved, but at the same time mistrust the mistrustful people, they are tempted to utilize the same procedures used by the dominant elites to oppress. Rationalizing their lack of confidence in the people, the leaders say that it is impossible to dialogue with the people before taking power thus opting for the anti-dialogical theory of action. Thenceforward, just like the dominant elites, they try to conquer the people. They become messianic, messianic. They use manipulation and carry out cultural invasion. By advancing along these paths, the paths of oppression, they will not achieve revolution, or if they do, it will not be authentic revolution. The role of revolutionary leadership under any circumstances, but especially so in those described, is to consider seriously, even as they act, the reasons for any attitude of mistrust on the part of the people, and to seek out true avenues of communion with them, ways of helping the people to help themselves critically perceive the reality which oppresses them. The dominated consciousness is dual, ambiguous, full of fear and mistrust. In his diary about the struggle in Bolivia, Guevara refers several times to the lack of peasant participation. 
the peasant mobilization does not exist, except for informative duties which annoy us somewhat. They are neither very rapid nor very efficient. They can be neutralized. Complete lack of incorporation of the peasants, although they are losing their fear of us, and we are succeeding in winning their admiration. It is a slow and patient task. The internalization of the oppressor by the dominated consciousness of the peasants explains their fear and their inefficiency. The behavior and reactions of the oppressed, which lead the oppressor to, pra to practice cultural invasion, should evoke from the revolutionary a different theory of action. What distinguishes revolutionary leaders from their dominant elite is not only their objectives, but their procedures. If they act in the same way, the objectives become identical. It is as self-contradictory for the dominant elites to pose human world relations as problems to the people as it is for the revolutionary leaders not to do so. Let us now analyze the theory of dialogical cultural action and attempt to apprehend its constituent elements. Cooperation. In the theory of anti-dialogical action, conquest, as its primary characteristic, involves a subject who conquers another person and transforms him or her into a thing. In the dialogical theory of action, subjects meet in cooperation in order to transform the world. The anti-dialogical dominating I transforms the dominated conquered thou into a mere it. The dialogical I, however, knows that it is precisely the thou, not I, which has called forth his or her own existence. He also knows that the thou, which calls forth his own existence in turn, constitutes an I, which has in his I its thou. The I and the thou thus become, in the dialectic of these relationships, two thous which become two eyes. The dialogical theory of action does not involve a subject who dominates by virtue of conquest and a dominated object. Instead, there are subjects who meet to name the world in order to transform it. If, at a certain historical moment, the oppressed, for the reasons previously described, are unable to fill their vocation as subjects, the posing of their very oppression as a problem, which always involves some form of action, will help them achieve this vocation. The above does not mean that, in the dialogical tasks, there is no role for revolutionary leadership. It means merely that the leaders in spite of their important, fundamental, and indispensable role, do not own the people and have no right to steer the people blindly towards their salvation. Such a salvation would be a mere gift from the leaders to the people, a breaking of the dialogical bond between them, and a reducing of the people from co-authors of liberation, liberating action into the objects of this action. Cooperation as a characteristic of dialogical action, which occurs only among subjects who may, however, have diverse levels of functions and thus of responsibility, can only be achieved through communication. Dialogue, as essential communication, must underlie any cooperation. In the theory of dialogical action, there is no place for conquering the people on behalf of the revolutionary cause but only for gaining their adherence. Dialogue does not impose, does not manipulate, does not domesticate, does not sloganize. This does not mean, however, that the theory of dialogical action leads nowhere, nor does it mean that the dialogical human does not have a clear idea of what she wants or of the objectives to which she is committed. The commitment of the revolutionary leaders to the oppressed is at the same time a commitment to freedom. And because of that commitment, the leaders cannot attempt to conquer the oppressed, but must achieve their adherence to liberation. Conquered adherence is not adherence. It is adhesion of the vanquished to the conqueror, who prescribes the options open to the former.
Authentic adherence is the free coincidence of choices. It cannot occur apart from communication among people mediated by reality. End of chapter 4, part 10.